these weren't bands that we ever thought we were putting on shows for or playing shows with because we could bring a good crowd. These were bands that we played with because afterwards we'd have the most intoxicatingly beautiful conversations we'd had with anyone in our lives. This is Adam Demergen, the former songwriter and multi-instrumentalist for one of the most enigmatic bands in underground music of the last generation, The Brave Little Abacus. Despite being broken up for eight years now, the cult status that this group has achieved online only seems to get more reputable as time goes on. Spin Magazine put Just Got Back From The Discomfort on their top 30 emo revival albums list, they hold two of the top three highest rated Midwest emo albums ever on Rate Your Music, and there's countless memes about them online wherever you go to get your musical meme fix. Now, now, I know that all of these accolades are relatively niche, but I find it most fascinating that nearly this group's entire catalog doesn't seem to officially exist anywhere, at least not anymore. The only way people have been able to listen to their music is via pirated versions on YouTube, SoundCloud, and even Spotify. Yes, this was not an official upload. Hell, these guys don't even have a Bandcamp page, with their only music on the platform being a split with Matt Aspinwall and some unofficially reposted live performances. Just who exactly is this band, and how did they amass such a beloved cult status in the internet music sphere with virtually no online presence whatsoever. Well, since the 10th anniversary of their most widely known album is just around the corner, I think now's as good a time as any to try and answer this question. The three founding members of the Brave Little Abacus, being frontman Adam Demersion, keyboard player Zach Onet, and bassist Andrew Ryan, started playing music together their freshman year of high school in a band called Eggplant Dance Off! with an exclamation point at the end. They were a ska group that, depending on which day of the week you caught them, had anywhere from five to eight members. While I would like to make a sarcastic comment about their music, I can't because there isn't any. The group's MySpace page is still available in the sense that you can click on it and view pictures. Oh, look at how young Adam is, Dorian Electra stole this. But whenever I click play on one of their songs, it refuses to. Maybe it's because I'm not signed in and I'm pretty sure it's illegal to make a MySpace page in 2020, but I was able to find a couple of YouTube videos of them performing live. However, given the 2006 camera quality, they sound more like Mersbo than the specials. And it's still better than most guy bands. The group actually planned on making a concept album about a mechanical bird who comes to life and flies from Japan to America, but they had to disband in 2007 because the horn players went off to college. Adam, Andrew, and Zach, though, were still interested in making music together, so during their junior year of high school, they officially formed the Brave Little Abacus. I don't know how they got that name, but I love it. They began to record and release songs for their MySpace page around 2008, compiling four of them into a demo? This is the earliest project in the Brave Little Abacus canon, and I find it kind of hilarious that they decided to call it demo with a question mark because it's kind of a demo, but not really. Whatever it is, it certainly isn't ska. In fact, it's pretty amazing that this is what the group was making so early into their career, as it's a little bit less chaotic and more composed than some of its successors, yet it's still crazy as all hell. It opens up with with abrasive screaming, weird vocal harmonies, and a backing beat that sounds like it's coming from a Game Boy. The bizarre fusion of acoustic guitars, electronics, and harsh vocals reminds me of early Animal Collective, but this comparison starts to wane a bit later in the track. The song's second movement mostly consists of horns, rhythm guitars, and chanting vocals, starkly contrasting how it started, yet still feeling pretty natural. It then closes out with an extended instrumental that's pretty much all electronic based, and that wasn't even five minutes, wow. Now I definitely get the impression with these songs that the band is trying to figure out which sounds work best for them, so they're testing the waters with everything they got, yet it doesn't come across as amateurish or even unfocused. If you told me this was an EP by an already established band with an eclectic palette, then I'd have no reason not to believe you, which I can't say about most demos. Or demos? The explosive crescendos that pop up all over You're Not Me But Neither Am I are absolutely exhilarating and make up for the repetitive guitar lead. The song also integrates some Ren and Stimpy dialogue samples that do a great job of keeping up the momentum, but also breaking up the monotony. This was the start of a staple in BLA's music, as they continued to integrate snippets of movies and TV shows into their songs that related to the topic in some way. The longest track, Imaginary Peaks, Imaginary Beasts, mostly consists of the same instrumental palette that made up the first couple tracks, but is more seeped in the softer guitar tones of post-rock, which makes every musical change-up flow a little more seamlessly. Easily my favorite on here, though, is the closer El Capitino, which is the most straightforward song in its fusions of math rock and electronica that play off of each other really nicely, especially when paired with Adam's passionate and nasally vocals. It then explodes into this wild frenzy of guitars and drums that, despite the repetitive riff, sounds somewhat improvised, yet still leaves room for one of the most iconic moments in a group's catalog. <laughs> No,
The song was so great, in fact, that it was not only the first song that they performed in their last ever live show. No, no, we're, we're not going to talk about that yet. But they actually put a slightly more cleaned up version of it on their next release from later that year, which was a self-titled split with a fellow musician who lived by them in New Hampshire, Matt Aspinwall. He takes up the first five tracks of the project alongside backing vocals from Adam, and it's a noticeable change of pace from BLA's usual shtick. It's much more synth-heavy, groovy, and dare I say poppier than pretty much anything else that wound up on a project of theirs, which makes sense considering it's not their side. That being said, these songs still feel at least marginally like BLA, with the chiptune arpeggios, linear song structures, and odd yet cohesive lyrics. Yeah, despite just being five unnamed tracks that appear on one side of a split, this thing reads like a whole ass concept album. Every one of these songs sees Matt speaking to a tree that he used to love to climb and eat apples from, but as he gets older, he not only finds himself growing further from the tree, but also more unsatisfied with his life. He eventually chops it down because he, uh, went crazy, but then regrets it and ends the project by referring to the tree as his greatest friend. Now, the tree is probably a metaphor for his carefree life as a child, with him cutting it down representing how those times are no more, but regardless of what interpretation you get out of it, it's much more interesting than it really even needed to be. I'm mostly just impressed that he stuck with this story so devotedly throughout his side of the project. This is actually the earliest example of music that I could find from this guy online, and listening to some of his subsequent projects reveals a much darker and more stripped-back singer-songwriter sound that's much different from the music presented on here. As I was doing research for this video, I also learned that Matt unfortunately passed away in 2017, so rest in peace, man. Flipping over to BLA's side, we get another unpredictable set of tracks that span a familiar yet fairly wide array of styles. Soul, for example, is a mostly instrumental track that has a tasteful blend of math rock spasms and post-rock meditations. The lyrics, while not as conceptual as the first side, are still full of recurring themes such as history repeating itself and how powerless most people are in the grander scheme of the world. A perfect example of this would be, yes, he did help overthrow Fulgencio Batista, but Che Guevara didn't wear his own t-shirts, which kind of speaks for itself in its message that no matter how much you're able to change something, you're always going to be restricted to some degree. Or on Good Atmosphere, which feels like a blissful acceptance of being useless. The latter of which has one of the weirdest instrumentals of any BLA song, combining this yapping vocal sample with tropical steel drums that make it sound like it's trying to be relaxing amidst dread and skepticism, which is exactly what the lyrics are like. The fan favorite on this record though is Untitled, and for good reason. It's one of their most ambitious tracks, especially during this stage of their career, undergoing numerous key and tempo changes throughout its 7 minute runtime, yet still feeling very holistic. It's not a perfect song, as I find some of the background vocals near the beginning of the track to be a little more obnoxious than endearing, but pretty much everything that's enjoyable about the band's music up to this point is well exemplified here. I also think the lyrics do a good job of tying the themes of the project into a more personal piece, with Adam giving one of his strongest vocal performances up until this point. Now, despite BLA having a one-of-a-kind sound that's unlike nearly anything else in modern rock, these two projects, while still pretty off the wall, have a large emphasis on twinkly guitars, off-kilter grooves, and emotional lyrics, which have caused most people to associate this band with the elusive Midwest emo revival. Supposedly starting in the late 2000s and early 2010s when emo was fading out of the mainstream, there was a big boom of bands who all decided that American football was the greatest thing ever and made music that sounded like them. Jokes aside, there are some pretty solid bands that came out of this, like The World is a Beautiful Place, Snowing, Nouns, Camping in Alaska, and Marietta, but it wasn't really a movement so much as it was a shift in demand. It's the typical story of a genre beginning in the underground and then evolving into its golden age before being picked up by the mainstream with a huge change in style, for better or for worse, and then falling out of the public eye back into the ears of dedicated listeners. While the Brave Little Abacus certainly has elements of Midwest emo in their music, even on their most celebrated records, I don't really like to look at them as an emo band, as they strike me more as just a group who's doing their own thing, and it happens to sound kinda emo. You could call the vocals whiny, but that's only because Adam has a naturally high voice that unintentionally fits the emo shtick whenever he sings passionately, which is probably the biggest reason why people even label them that to begin with. Also, in the interviews with him that exist online, which I highly recommend, I'll link them in the description, he never mentions being influenced by any bands that you'd call emo. Rather, he cites the likes of Fugazi, They Might Be Giants, Liz Fair, and Bomb the Music Industry as bands that have inspired him in some way. Although you could argue that Fugazi influenced every emo band ever. In fact, uh, around the same time that BLA was getting started, Adam played in a ska punk group called Interrobang? With an exclamation point and question mark at the end. And they actually opened for Bomb the Music Industry at a release party for their 2009 album Scrambles alongside a few other acts like The Brass and Sean Bennett from AJJ. It was on this night that Steve Foote and Jeff Rosenstock himself decided 
decided to help produce Intero Bank's next album, For John. While this record wouldn't see the light of day until after BLA had already broken up, Adam and Jeff became fairly close to each other in the process, and even put out Ukume, the very last EP that BLA ever made, on Jeff's label, quote unquote, records. Probably my favorite part of the story, though, aside from the fact that Adam and Sean Bennett were both in the same building together at one point, is that Laura Stevenson from Bomb the Music Industry actually makes an appearance in their last ever live show. No, no, we're, we're not there yet. After the band had begun to establish themselves with a decent chunk of songs and a few live performances, they decided it was time to make their full-length debut, and they went all out for it, both musically and physically, because they pressed 1,500 CD copies of it which seems like a good idea at the time. The full title of this album is Mass Dancers Concerned in So Many Things You Forget Where You Are, but it has so many words and I forget what they are, so I just call it Mass Dancers. However, I think the full title sums up a lot of the album's themes of being overwhelmed with the responsibilities of growing up and leaving the person you used to be when you were younger. Before I go forward though, I want to say that the lyrics on this album are pretty cryptic and difficult to comprehend, so if you have any other interpretations or want to add something, then please let me know in the comments. And that goes for all of these albums from here on out. Throughout the album, Adam tells this abstract story that reads both like a letter to a dead friend and a desire to go back to a simpler time. The opening track, I See It Too, starts with serene and minimal guitar playing that emphasizes the peaceful imagery of nature found in the lyrics, communicating this feeling of not wanting anything to change. As the music gets more ominous and the vocals become more unhinged, the inevitability of Adam losing a part of himself begins to draw closer and closer. Around the four minute mark, the instrumental begins to explode with fast tempo drums and guitar shredding, which then unfolds into this simple yet beautiful chord progression backed by Zach's bittersweet keyboard playing. Bringing all of this home are these shouted vocals, which might not be mixed properly in a conventional sense, but sound as if he's screaming for help amidst the chaotic mess that is both his life and the instrumental. It then calms down again with a guitar part that sounds similar to how the track started before crescendoing into its final climax. It flows near perfectly into the next track, which is a one minute interlude that consists of a spoken sample from the Japanese film Akira, on top of an anxiety-fueled backing instrumental. Samples from this movie show up later on the album, and I think similarly to how that film is about a boy who becomes way too powerful and ends up destroying everything around him, Mass Dancers is about the fears of losing connection with either people in your life or your old environment as a result of a change in personality. The quotes that the band decided to sample are interesting too, as even though they're in Japanese, the track titles of these interludes being But I Won't Always Be on the Receiving End and He Never Existed in the First place are lifted directly from the movie and fit the album's narrative. A Map of Stars is where we really start to see the theme of leaving Earth and going to some form of an afterlife explored in an interesting way. He uses a map of stars, or a sky full of stars, as a sort of bridge slash barrier between him and the world that his friend is in. However, I think the friend that he alludes to throughout the album is his past self and how he wishes he could go back to who he once was. Again, I don't know for sure because I haven't seen any of the members speak on it directly, but that's my interpretation of it. This theme is continued on the next track, Waiting for Your Return Like Running Backwards, and despite just being a one minute intro for the next song, it has some of the most direct and powerful lyrics on the album. In fact, with how well it bleeds into the next song, it was probably all recorded as one track, but they chose to separate it just to emphasize these specific lyrics, allowing them to stand on their own in the lyric sheet that came with the CD. Through Hallways is one of the catchiest on the album, with its driving rhythm that complements the vocals rather than distracting from them, as well as a strangely remixed vocal sample in the background that sounds like a more refined version of what they were doing on Good Atmosphere from the Matt Aspinwall split. Lyrically, it reads like a desperate cry to speak with the person he wants to talk to who is no longer on this earth, with some of the most surreal yet vivid imagery on the record. After the next Akira interlude, we get the album's centerpiece, Born Again So Many Times You Forget You Are, which not only has a similar title to the album, but continues one of its biggest motifs in being born again. The track starts off as a manic cry of paranoia, that the narrator feels after realizing the inevitable changes that will come in his life, so he begs to be reborn into a state where he can relive what he's become accustomed to. However, in the process of doing so, he transfers into this numb state where he can't feel or do anything at all, perhaps alluding to the impossibility of going back and the necessity of change. The track is a constant back and forth between these two mentalities, with the instrumentation changing frequently, yet every passage being equally dizzying. Underground is maybe the bleakest song in the entire 
album, with Adam speaking on feeling disconnected from the world around him by being metaphorically underground. I view this setting as the antithesis of the map of stars that he used to find his past self in the afterlife earlier. It's as if he's saying that he not only feels further away from him than ever before, but the more distant he gets, the more uncertain he is about his own life and those around him. Musically, the track complements this too, as it's a little bit lower and more bass heavy than the rest of the album. Playing off of this song's theme is Remember to Wave When Looking Down from the Clouds, which feels relatively optimistic in context of the record. Not only is it the only song on here and one of the only BLA songs period that actually has a hook, but it's full of upbeat rhythms and even a couple of horn parts that feel almost reminiscent of the ska sound that fueled the first band these guys came from. The end of the track even has similarly sung backup vocals to the ones on Untitled that I said were annoying, but in this context I think they work a little bit better. Not only because of how they're mixed, but how they feel like an emotional payoff after a long and sad journey. Lyrically, the song sees Adam talking to his plausibly dead friend, knowing well that he can't hear him, but still taking comfort in the hope that he's out there somewhere. This idea is perfectly wrapped up in the closing track, It's A Lot It's Seamless, starting off as another fast-paced but bittersweet piece of math rock that acts as a proper but devastating goodbye to the character that's been spoken to throughout the album. Halfway through the song, though, it switches to probably the most melodic and cohesively musical moment on the entire album, reflecting on all of the themes that were spoken upon with no resolution to the conflict, but a slightly more positive outlook on it. And with that, we have Mass Dancers, the first full-length album in the band's catalog, and man, what an album to start with. This thing is packed with so many interesting lyrics, passionate vocals, beautiful instrumentals, and complex playing that all comes together into one of the most ambitious records of its kind. The members were all seniors in high school when they made this too, which is not only impressive on its own, but gives context to all of the lyrics about being scared to move forward in life and live in a new environment. Not to mention they did it entirely independently without any backing from a label or anything like that, proving that you don't need to have a big budget to make an amazing album. So what now for the band? The members were all going off to college and they had just put out a record that could have easily been the perfect swan song. I mean, given its thematic details of moving on in life, it almost feels like a direct reflection of where the band was at and how it was going to end soon. Well, as the members all went off to college, they stayed in the same New Hampshire area that they'd grown up in and planned on continuing the band for as long as possible. However, as people do when they get older, the members all started doing their own thing and not spending as much time together as they could before. Zach took some time to study abroad in Italy, Andrew was busy with work and a relationship that prevented him from being emo enough to play in the Brave Little Abacus, and Adam was working on writing and demoing more material for their next album, yet its future looked uncertain. On New Year's Day of 2010, the band got together and decided that given the circumstances, it was time to break up but they wanted to finish one last record so that Adam's work wouldn't go to waste. The recording process for this album would be pretty tumultuous, with different instrumental layers having to be recorded in different locations, and computer crashes that caused fragments of the album to either sound worse or become lost entirely. Adam speaks about it pretty thoroughly around the 46 and a half minute mark in this particular interview, and I'd recommend giving it a listen if you're curious. This album was released on Bandcamp on May 29th, 2010, sometime around 3 in the morning, with very little to get the word out out about it. There were never any physical copies or big shows to promote the album, it was just released very casually, with a picture of Adam's dad walking out of a convenience store that his mom took on their honeymoon being the album cover. The full title of this album is Just Got Back From The Discomfort, We're All Right, and I just got back from reading the title and am all right with calling it Discomfort. This has gone on to be by far the group's most popular work, with a particular upload of it to YouTube in 2013 having nearly 100,000 views at the time of me writing this, in fact it may have already passed past that by the time this goes up. While Masked Dancer certainly has a cult following and is beloved by most who've heard it, Discomfort is brought up much more often when discussing the band and is generally more acclaimed. It's difficult to compare these two albums though because they're very different from each other. Masked Dancers is an existential nightmare that tackles themes of death, nostalgia, and growing more dissatisfied with life as it goes on. Discomfort, while having a similarly abstract lyrical style, reads much more like a breakup album that deals with more immediate and personal issues than its predecessor. This is also reflected in the visceral and chaotic compositions that back up the infectious vocals and songwriting. It's to the point where, despite these two albums having a similar runtime, Discomfort feels significantly shorter, yet isn't any less eventful or grandiose. The opening moments of Pile No Pile Pile waste no time in thrusting the listener into a cacophonous wreck. The vocals are so loud and in your face, yet sound so helpless and like they could completely break down at any moment. The backing piano parts are simple and even kind of pretty, 
but can only be heard subtly behind an intricate wall of crashing cymbals and off-kilter drumming. The track eventually breaks down and lets the vocals become more audible, but due to Adam's slurred delivery and the lo-fi production, it's still pretty hard to make out anything he's saying. That being said, it doesn't take me out of the music in any way. In fact, I think a big part of the charm of this band is just how well the vocals and music play off of each other and being so unconventional and yet so emotionally resonant. If you do actually read into the lyrics of this song though, you'll find an extremely wordy and vivid description of being overwhelmed with different problems piling onto one another one by one. The overcomplicated and borderline stream of consciousness lyrics not only fit the song topic, but embody it in a way that's as genuine as it is meta. As we get to the end of the track, we're carried out by a sad piano lead backed by a droning synthesizer and are introduced to some of the album's main lyrical motifs. We hear mentions of the schizophrenic perception that there are two different versions of himself, a mysterious figure named Hannah, and the repetition of the phrase way before now. We also get a sampled clip from Malcolm in the Middle that more clearly establishes the breakup theme that these lyrics are tied to. I think the two different versions of himself that Adam alludes to are the one that was during this relationship and the one after it ended. This is brought up again on the next track, Please Don't Cry They Stopped Hours Ago, where he fleshes out this idea of not being loved anymore and how distant he feels from the way he felt when he was. This track also introduces the sounds of chiptune synthesizers that are usually arpeggiated to not only help guide the jumbled layers of instrumentation, but to give it a unique sound from contemporaries in both indie and punk. This song is actually much groovier and easier to follow than a lot of the songs in the group's catalog thanks to a strong rhythm guitar section and a memorable vocal refrain that shows up a couple of times in the song's first section. It then quiets down a bit with some soft guitars and tambourines to back up the track's most potent lyrical moments, and even throws in some wind chimes and a horn solo to give it a little more direction. It closes out on a crescendo that perfectly flows into the mostly instrumental boys theme. This song has a simple and strung out melody that repeats itself, yet acts as a nice breather to help calm down the protagonist after the first couple of songs. It even ends pretty optimistically with a clip of someone on the phone telling Adam that one of BLA's songs is playing on the radio. After this though, we are quickly thrust back into the album's spiraling insanity with a highway got paved over my future, I drive it getting to school, and man I love these track titles. This song takes place right after the phone call that was at the end of Boy's Theme, and even breaks the fourth wall a bit in how it mentions moving through life through the crashing of a cymbal. You could take these lyrics to mean he is literally listening to himself on the radio, but I like to view it as a play on the phrase marching to the beat of your own drum, with his legs shaking meant to illustrate how nervous he is on a day-to-day -day basis. He also makes a reference to Liz Fair's Nashville, which makes me think that that's what he was listening to in the car instead of himself. This is one of the shortest songs in the entire album, yet it feels so vast in how occupied it is by this triumphant brass section that dominates the second half. It then transitions perfectly into the blah blah blahs, which has this really unique combination of a keyboard arpeggio and a sample of sonic jumping that shows up in the last note of each quadruplet, but starts to fall out of sync in a kind of offbeat way. The different musical moments that make up this track are usually separated by this accented keyboard part that's so in sync with the aggressive drumming that it's nothing short of exhilarating. The vocals match this too, as Adam gives one of his most heartfelt performances ever, especially during this little bridge that shows up in the middle of the track where he gradually gets throatier and more growly with each repeating phrase. Speaking of the lyrics, I see this song as being about Adam regretting the things that he said in his life and how it could possibly tie to this now ended relationship. He even brings up the idea that there is more than one version of himself yet again, with his past self critiquing how hard it is for his current self to adapt to a new situation. It's here where I started to notice the thematic similarities between this record and Masked Dancers, as they both play with the idea of a single person being multiple different people throughout their life. After calming down with the nicely layered bit of ambience that closes out the blah blah blahs, we get the wonderful acoustic balladry of Can't Run Away, which is my favorite Brave Little Abacus song period. Despite being a great deal quieter, and calmer than nearly every other song on this album, the complexity isn't sacrificed. Backing up the acoustic guitar lead is some calming percussion that sounds like it's coming from maracas and a tambourine, and some excellent bass work from Andrew that in most songs is unfortunately easy to overlook given how most of the band's music is mixed. It then starts to build up around the minute and 55 second mark with some beautiful wind chimes that make the whole thing sound really whimsical. The lyrics fit this as it's a dreamlike reflection of past memories and experiences, both the 
negative ones that push him down and the positive ones that keep him going. On pretty much every lyric website that I've seen that has this song, the lyrics say Hat of Green shows symmetry in front of Hat alone sits me, but I actually think he could be saying Hannah Green instead of Hat of Green. I'll play it with both lyrics on screen and let you decide. Hat of Green shows symmetry in front of Hat alone sits me. He very well could be saying hat, and it's possible that they put all the lyrics on Bandcamp when the album came out and people preserve them, but I think it would make more sense if he said Hannah, given the rest of the lyrical context. He starts off the song reflecting on when the two broke up and how bad of an experience it was, but also how not much else moving forward could possibly make him feel worse. Even if he is saying hat here, I think the possibility that these lyrics are about a breakup is still entirely possible. After reminiscing some more and building up vocally along with the track, he remembers good times that he had with his dad listening to Tom Petty and how important the people in his life really are to him. The instrumental then quiets down again, allowing Adam to say the most blunt and potent line on the album. When I say I'm sad, I mean it. And then quickly gets all cryptic again. Despite how this track sounds nothing like anything else in the BLA canon, I see it as the centerpiece to the album. Not only does it perfectly summarize a lot of its themes and motifs, but it does it in a way that's hopeful amidst the overwhelmingly sad atmosphere. Continuing with this theme of reminiscing on the past is Untitled Continued, which is obviously meant to be a continuation of the track from the Mad Aspen Wall split. And while I don't entirely see how these two particular songs connect, I think the title is still fitting. Adam yearns for the days when he was either still in this relationship or just a happier guy in general. Speaking as if a part of himself has transcended into another being and is gone forever. I love the way that the cryptic poetry on this record occasionally unfolds into a very understandable and sad lyric that's easy for anyone to relate to and connects deeper into the narrative in some way. He does that on this song with this little section right here, and even a little bit later when he makes a metaphorical reference to the relationships in his life being co-pilots in cockpits made of tin. Well, it isn't too different musically from what we've already heard, it stays refreshing in the way it continues to exercise all of the creative ways that you can have guitars, brass, and synthesizers all work in the context of Midwest emo-inspired music. Every unique passage that makes up how these songs are structured present one emotional gut punch after another, with differing degrees of intensity. This is especially true in the record's second half, as nearly every song from here on out flows seamlessly into one another. I mean, they kind of did before, but now there's no more long outros that make the songs feel separated. All Bait, or Morning Love Song, is a another one of the shortest tracks on the album, but it does a lot in its barely over two minute runtime. There isn't too much to say about it lyrically, other than that it sounds like a longing to return to this now ended relationship, but it has maybe the most memorable and quotable vocal refrain on the entire album. The track still feels like a small fragment in a larger picture, but that alone makes it stand out as its own song. The calming and jingly guitars that are a staple in this genre carry on into the next track, It's Not What You Think It Is, making the first bulk of the song feel like another cooldown. That doesn't stop Adam from spilling his guts out though, as he continues to lament passionately about what's on his mind. The first part of this song sounds like a critique of counterculture, and how hating on things that are mainstream just because they're popular is getting old to him. This could possibly be the mindset that he used to feel and wants to move on from, which ties into the theme of self-growth. The song climaxes in its final moments with a faster tempo, louder guitars, and vocals that are screamed so loud it sounds like the microphone is going to start clipping. What's even more interesting though are the lyrics, which bring back the same metaphor and structure as the ending of Untitled Continued, as if to emphasize this fear that Adam has of growing further apart from everyone around him. We're then met with another calming instrumental track in the form of Alston, Massachusetts, December 2009 through January 2010, which is possibly a a reference to a location that they did live shows in or the time that the album was written. Either way, it's an entirely acoustic instrumental that comes across as doleful and hopeless, but kind of relaxing at the same time. Bug infested floorboards, can we just leave this place now, is according to Adam himself. It's about moving out of a dirty house in Dover. A really, really dirty house that I didn't live in, but I sure as helped them move all their shit out of it. Thanks a lot, guys. 
The song was inspired by a real experience he went through, as trivial as it may sound, but I think the track still holds a lot of meaning in context of the album. The lyrics can be taken pretty literally for the first part of the song, but eventually Adam breaks down and does somewhat of a spoken word bit that comes across as a reflection of his past self and how he's still connected with him. The repetition of the phrase shut up and swallow that shows up all over the track is likely in reference to him having to persevere in cleaning out this old house, but I think the house itself could be looked at as a symbol for a place he'll no longer be that he was once familiar with, even if he didn't live there. I also know that I could be digging way too deep into this and that my interpretations might not have been the intentions at all. Stop taking your art so seriously, guys. But I don't care, it's what I like to do. There's a couple more Malcolm in the Middle samples on this track as well that I think add to the overall nervous tension found in the lyrics. Closing out the record, we get the short but overwhelmingly sweet send-off that is orange blue with stripes. This song feels like finally reaching the light at the end of a long black tunnel with its triumphant keyboard part that dominates the instrumental, and even the vocals sound slightly more cheery. While the lyrics are still kind of cryptic, it sounds like he's finally come to the realization that there is only one of him and that he needs to learn from his past trauma instead of dwelling on the pain. He brings up the Hannah figure once more, and even the way before now motif, that makes the record come full circle. It's kind of like the inverse of pile no pile pile, where instead of being stressed out over the constant pile of issues, he's learned to overcome them and move on with a more positive outlook. The very last thing we hear on this album is a quick snippet, once again taken from Malcolm in the Middle, simply saying, at some point it stops. This not only perfects the track as an optimistic ending to an otherwise depressing album, but even even feels like a callback to the very first lyric on the album where he says, you're not listening, I said stop. Overall, Discomfort is an absolute journey from start to finish, packed with interesting lyrics, unique instrumentals that are unlike anything else in this style, and some of my favorite vocal performances in any album period. I named it as my second favorite album of the decade when I made that list a few months ago, and I still entirely stand by this. Now, as for whether or not I prefer this album or Mass Dancers, it's kinda up in the air. If I really had to pick, I'd probably go with Discomfort just because I find myself returning to it a bit more often, but I would give them both 10 out of 10s. Obligatory ratings aside though, what came next for the band? After all, they did decide that after this album was finished, it was time for them to break up due to life circumstances. Well, as fantastic as this record is, it never really felt like a grand conclusion for the band, as they released it pretty haphazardly on Bandcamp with very little to get the word out about it. However, despite their talks of breaking up, they managed to stay together as a band for another couple of years because they were not about to let their ties to Jeff Rosenstock go to waste. In January of 2012, a day before their last ever live show, they released a four-track EP called Ukume on Jeff's internet label quote-unquote records. They were actually able to press them on 7-inch LPs, which have skyrocketed in value due to the band's cult following. If you happen to have one laying around, then it might be worth a pretty penny or two. While Ukume may seem a little anticlimactic given how short it is, I think it's the perfect closing statement to the band's catalog. The opening track, For John For Colin, seems to be about the ending of the band themselves, but on a positive note that ensures that the real brave little Abacus was the friends they made along the way. And so this being over, I, I think I want it, and I think we can all say this, to be really different than other bands being over, because we all know you and we all care about you. It's not, you're not just fa faces, and you're not, you're not just bodies, your relationships and your memories, and I think this band being over will only mean that we won't be playing shows and we won't be putting out records. It won't mean that we can still positively affect each other and we can still know each other, and I, I really want you guys to to know that we all care about you very, very much, and we, we care about these memories, and, and that's not, this breakup doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that. The sentiment of that whole statement is pretty much what this record embodies, and it doesn't overstay its welcome. It maintains the distinctly mathy and complicated style of a BLA project, but is easily the happiest this group has ever sounded on a record. Hell, the title of this EP is a reference to a character in the 1997 live-action Disney film Jungle to Jungle, and there's even a sample of it that shows up near the end of the record. Adam's vocals are still well-performed, and the instrumentals are still on point, but its fast tempos and shouted lyrics act more as a means of being upbeat and cheerful than anxious and schizophrenic. Going back to For John, the song feels like a huge victory lap for the band, with its joyful keyboards, catchy vocal melody, and even the bass gets to shine on here. In classic BLA fashion, the instrumentation undergoes a fair amount of change-ups that all flow seamlessly and sync up with the new ideas that are presented in the lyrics. Also, if you're confused by the title of this song, it's a reference to the Interrobang album For John that was still in development at the time. I'm guessing Colin was one of the members in that band, but I 
don't know for sure because I can't find any documentation of all the band members' names. This idea of saying goodbye but staying optimistic continues into 45 minutes from somewhere out there, which is something that Adam wrote when one of his friends was having a hard time and he felt like he couldn't do anything to help her out. I feel it still ties into the tape thematically, as it's about sticking by friends even when something changes. The song also has some of the most memorable vocal refrains in the band's entire discography. Don't come around here no more please acts as a final reflection of the situations that were spoken upon in their previous music. It doesn't sound too different from the rest of the tape, but the crescendo in the middle of the track that backs up this verse is the ultimate grand finale to the band's career, and is carried out by this droning haze of harmonicas and horns that sound like a different spin on the ambient interludes from Discomfort. Even the very last sample on here fits thematically, as not only is it an indication that this is the end of the band, but it gives more meaning to the title as well. That just leaves the very last song that the band ever released, which is a cover of Introducing Morrissey by The Ergs. It's a peppy indie rock joint about the singer's love for the Smiths, and even references The Queen is Dead in the lyrics at one point. I kind of just view this as a bonus track and something that the group always wanted to cover just because they love the song, and it's really well earned. In fact, it's the last song that they ever performed live during their final live show at the Vic Gary Center that took place the day after the 7 inch was pressed, and yes, we finally get to talk about that. I'll admit that I didn't find out about this band until long after they had already broken up, but for some reason, this performance always gets me so emotional. It's far from perfect from a recording standpoint, as there's plenty of times where you can't really hear the vocals at all, but it's really amazing to me how talented and unique these guys really were, especially for a band that formed in high school. This should serve as an inspiration for all young aspiring musicians that it is possible to make something incredible if you have the talent and creativity to back it up. Also, the stage banter that Adam gives is some of the most wholesome and genuinely heartwarming stuff that I've heard from any live performance, and gives it all a great sense of community, even if you weren't there to experience it. He even brings his dad up to play drums when they do American Girl by Tom Petty that's so wholesome! The whole thing was well documented on YouTube by a fellow named Ty Yuta, and I'd recommend watching all of it, I'll leave a link in the description. And that was the end of the Brave Little Abacus, at least for their time as a band. The question still remains though, why can't you stream any of their music, and will we ever see an official reissue of any of their records? Well, as stated by Adam in that same interview from 2017 that I referred to before, the reason why you can't find any of their albums on Bandcamp anymore is because sometime after they released Ukume, they ran out of free downloads and the site started charging people to listen to them, which they didn't like very much, so they decided to take everything down. He's also stated that he no longer has the original files for Discomfort, and even if he did, he seems really uninterested in the idea. He sees himself in BLA as just a kid who was learning the ropes, and seems to want to leave it all in the past. Nowadays, he's focused on a new band that he's formed called Me and Capri's, alongside drummer Nick Moran, who played alongside BLA during their last live show, and a bass and rhythm guitar player whose names I can't find. If you know what they are, please leave a comment. They've been putting out music since 2015, debuting with a six-track EP called For Those Who Thank You, later being remastered in 2018 with a few bonus tracks. It's a very solid indie rock project that continues to show off Adam's sincere and intimate approach to songwriting, but in a way that's much more coherent than any BLA record. They're supposedly dropping an official album later this year called Injustice for Malls, and have even done some live performances that you can find on YouTube as recently as one month ago. And oh my gosh, he played Orange Blue with Stripes! That was a song called Orange, Orange Blue with Stripes, Stripes by the brave little Wacticus. Haha, <laughs> I see what you did there. I'd highly recommend keeping an eye out for these guys in the future and supporting them on Bandcamp. So overall, I think the Brave Little Abacus has certainly earned their place as a cult internet phenomenon. Their bold creativity, cryptic yet powerful lyricism, and emotionally provocative soundscapes makes for a one-of-a-kind sound that I can't get enough of. I understand if the nasally vocals, poor production quality, and unconventional sounds are off-putting to some, but I think all of those things add up into one of the most genuine and charming bands that couldn't have really existed in any era prior to the one they came out of. I hope you check out this band, or more of their records if you haven't already, and would love to know what you guys think about them. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed, you know the drill.